we have Wesley with us here, and um, thank you, Wesley, for joining us. Uh, and um, you know, um, admittedly, because of because it's the first time we are doing things online, uh, there's a little bit of a jitter. But uh, we have Wesley with us now, and thank you, Wesley, for joining us. Um, so a little bit about uh, Wesley. Uh, Wesley Chun is uh, the author of Prentice Hall's best-selling core Python books. He's the core co-author of Python web development with Django, and has uh, written for Linux Journal, CNET, and Inform IT. Now, if this sounds a little bit of um, you know a scripted thing, because it is, I'm just reading out of the speaker info. But he is known for a lot more things. Um, he is also uh, one of the fellows of the Python Software Foundation, and uh, he's actually he doesn't need introduction, even though I'm giving it. And today's talk that he is presenting is about serverless computing with Python. Uh, so you know, since we are already one minute past the, the mark, I'm going to add him to the stream. Um, so Wesley, uh, now I'm going to add you to the stream, and you can also um, I'll add your shared screen as well. So uh, yeah, and I'll be off the stage, but. Um, Oh, also, let me tell you a couple of things. The badge says Anirudh Menon, but my name is Abhiram. And um, the other people assisting me with uh, assisting me today are Nitin, uh, Satish, and um, uh, Abdur. So thanks to all the volunteers uh, who are helping out. You know, because we are we, we wouldn't be doing this without any of us. Right? <laughs> uh, and uh, yeah, uh, and uh, regarding the timings, uh, Wesley, your talk is for 25 minutes. Uh, plus five minutes for Q and A. You are free to go uh, across over the twenty-five minute mark as well. In case uh, you would prefer to take Q and A questions later on, and you need the full thirty minutes, but uh, I'll give you a small warning at the end of twenty-five minutes so that you can you can take Q and A questions. And uh, people, please feel free to put in your questions on the chat, uh, hop in chat, and um, our um, uh, someone from uh, our volunteer team will. Uh, Give us the questions to be put on the screen, right? So there will be no interruptions for Wesley, and there will be no problem for you to get your questions answered as well. So thank you. Uh, I've taken more than my share of time, Wesley. Welcome. Great, thank you. Uh, can everybody hear me? I'm guessing everybody can uh, hear me. Say something so we know can be heard. Right. Okay. Great. Um, so get your questions answered as well. So thank you. Sure. OK. As long as everyone can hear me, I'm going to start. OK. All right. Hello, everyone. And uh, or I should, instead of hello, can I say namaskara? <laughs> it's It's been a few years since I've been to uh, Bangalore. I'll just pretend I'm back there again, eating all your good food and everything. So um, anyway, I'm happy to be here talking to you about serverless computing uh, with Python. Um, I am a developer advocate at Google and uh, a little bit more about me on the next page. But before I leave here, uh, one thing I wanted you to have is in case you know the conference is over or you didn't get a chance to ask your question, uh, there is a link here to the op this open Google Doc where you can ask questions for me later, or you can use this barcode as well. So just kind of like jot that down or take a picture of it. Uh, since you're all on your computers, you can take a, a screenshot of it. Um, and then ask me later. But you know, I'll try and answer as many of the questions on chat as well too, OK? so. Uh, a little bit more about me. Uh, my background is that my, you know, my goal is to enable all current and future developers everywhere, you know, around the world, including India, to be successful using Google Cloud and other Google Developer tools and APIs. Uh, before I joined the Cloud Platform team, I used to be on the G Suite team. So a lot of the videos that you see of me online are going to be of G Suite content, which is, you know, Gmail, Google Drive, Calendar, Doc Sheets, and Slides. Uh, you know, of course, instead of showing you how to use those apps, uh, I'm telling you how to code them. So that's really what those videos are. Uh, but my background has mostly been a software engineer. Um, I was one of the original engineers that built Yahoo, uh, Yahoo Mail many years ago. And, uh, you know, I've written some Python books. Uh, mostly, I have, I have, believe it or not, I have a teaching background as well, too. So in addition to being an engineer, I have a parallel career being a teacher um, also. I'm part of the Python community, and then that's my academic background. Okay, so let's uh, see what the agenda is today. 
So I'm gonna give you a very uh, fast sort of like review, overview, review of cloud computing, just so that everybody's on the same page. Uh, and uh, so that is vendor, uh, vendor independent. So it applies to Microsoft Azure, it applies to AWS, as well as Google Cloud. So it's not, it's not vendor related. So it's just a very generic high level overview. Then I'll talk a little bit more specifically about Google Cloud and what are the groups of products that we have there. And then of course, the main topic of the talk is serverless computing and where to run your code. Uh, and then uh, after the main talk, I will sh uh, give you some examples of inspirational apps that are running on serverless, just to kind of give you an idea of the things that you can build. Uh, and then we'll uh, leave you with a lot of links that you can chase down. Uh, you will also have a copy of the slides. I have a link to the PDF and the PDF has the links that are clickable. So, you know, if you can't see the URL, but you can tell it's a link, uh, don't worry, you, you should be able to click it uh, in the PDF when you get it. Okay, so how about reviewing cloud computing? So what is cloud computing? Well, you know, the easiest way I like to say it is that a company doesn't want to support something, so they're going to outsource it, okay? So, for example, it could be computing, it could be storage, uh, it could be applications. And one of the most famous applications that we outsource that I worked on is email, right? So many years ago, in order to do email, you had to have an email server on your desk, on your workstation, uh, and you had to monitor it. But as the internet became, you know, more, uh, you know, more widely used, you can't really expect people to do that. You know, my grandmother, you know, I'm not going to ask her to maintain SMTP on port 25 on her computer. It is unreasonable, right? So we've chosen instead of running the mail servers ourselves to outsource that service to a company like, you know, Google for Gmail or Yahoo for Yahoo Mail or uh, Microsoft for uh, Outlook.com or Hotmail. Right, so we're outsourcing. We the responsibility for sending and receiving mail is no longer our responsibility because now we are paying a cloud vendor to do it for us. All right, so that's what cloud computing is, and it's all of those, not just one of them. So more particularly, as far as you know, email goes, it's one of it falls into one of the cloud pillars. So these are like the well-known three service levels. You have software as a service, uh, infrastructure as a service, and platform as a service. So the email example I brought up is an example of a software as a service. That's email, right? So that's Gmail, Yahoo Mail, Hotmail. In fact, all of uh, G, G Suite or Google Apps, which is you know Gmail, Google Drive, Calendar, Docsheet, Slides, Salesforce, Office 365, all of those are examples of SaaS apps. They are basically cloud-based applications that you do not install on your computer, but instead you access them and you log into them via a web browser. It is a application that's in the cloud now. So I've outsourced the application. So that's SaaS. At the very bottom is where I'm outsourcing hardware. That's where I need virtual machines and big storage. So Compute Engine, EC2, S3, Cloud Storage, all of those count. Most cloud vendors have an infrastructure service. So this is at the basic, you know, the raw hardware that you're trying to outsource because you don't want to buy it because it gets obsolete and things like that. In fact, when you buy a laptop, as soon as it arrives at your door, uh, it's already obsolete, right? Uh, that's just how it works. Now, it's great that uh, cloud vendors have this service, but if you're trying to get a VM and your purpose is to run an application, well, guess what? It's not as easy as that because you also have to decide what's the operating system. I have to do, you know, Windows Server or Linux. If so, which distribution if, and then which kernel version. So that decision has to be made. Then you have to decide on web server, database server, you know, and all these different things that you're responsible for in addition to the application code. So it's really a lot of work. So the best spot is sort of like the sweet spot is in the middle with platform as a service. This is where you don't have to worry about the hardware. You just write the applications and you upload it to, you know, Google or Heroku or AWS Lambda, and then the cloud vendors run it for you. You don't have to worry about the hardware. You don't care what operating system it is, okay? And one of the things I also want you to know is that if you're writing an application on a platform as a service system, just think about it this way. You are actually writing an application that is a SaaS app for your users, okay? Let me take, take it from a different angle. You know, like if you find a bug in Gmail, you can't go and fix it because it's not your code. You have to file a ticket or a bug with Google and it's up to our engineers to fix it. So as users, we don't have control over the code for a SaaS app. So similarly for you, if you are writing a, an application and you run it on a PaaS system, you have created a SaaS app for your customers. And so your customers can't fix the bug. They have to file a ticket with you and you have to fix the bug, right? Because it's your code, okay? 
So there's a there's a relationship between PaaS and SaaS, and of course, there's also a relationship between these two as well. Now, with any large ecosystem, there's always going to be gray areas in between, and so cloud is no exception. So in between infrastructure and platform as a service, you have all these intermediate services. They're more than raw hardware. So if you look at the names, it's it's not VMs, it's not disk, it's more than that, right? So these are typically networking services, data services like databases, data processing, data analytics, containers are there, right? So it's a layer that sits on top of hardware, but it's not like you can upload code to them and run it, right? You know, obviously you can upload SQL, but that's not the same as applications. Uh, and then similarly, between SaaS and PaaS, you have what I call restricted PaaS systems. So these are these are past systems, but what's different about them is that they generally rely on data that live at the SaaS level. Okay, so in other words, you can use AppScript, you can use Force.com, they're great, but if you don't do so with G Suite data or Salesforce data, there's no need for you to use these systems. Just use the general ones down here because they're more multi-purpose, right? These are more specialized. So. Anyway, so that's what I wanted to say about the uh, the two gray areas, the gray area between infrastructure and platform, again, the data services, the network services, things that are more than hardware, and then finally, the uh, gray area between SaaS and PaaS, which are restricted PaaS systems. All right, so that's cloud. So let's look at it from a different perspective, like what are you responsible for? Okay, so as far as responsibility goes, if you're doing SaaS apps, well, guess what? You've outsourced everything, including the app. So there's really nothing for you to do except for, you know, like your personal, you know, if you're using e email, right? Your personal, your your email signature uh, and anything that's kind of like a user setting. Everything else is outsourced. You don't care what operating system. You don't care what language is written in. None of that. If it's a PaaS system, you've outsourced everything but not your application code because it's your code and the data for your application. And then at the infrastructure level, you've outsourced the hardware, you know, which is the four things down below, but then you're responsible for everything else from the operating system all the way up to your application. And of course, if you're not using the cloud, you're on-premise, then you're responsible for everything. So uh, hopefully this was a good introduction to, you know, review of cloud. I know everybody knows what cloud computing is, but I just want to mention what all of cloud is because some people think, oh, it's only the infrastructure part. You know, a cloud is only VMs and big disk. Uh, or the other way around, it's it, cloud is only G Suite or Office 365. There's nothing else that's cloud, right? And both of those statements are false because cloud is all of these things. All right, so now that we know what cloud is, let's talk about Google Cloud. All right, so what is Google Cloud? Google Cloud is a large conglomerate inside Google, and we make two big uh, products, uh, par product groups. One is the GCP, which is Google Cloud Platform, and then the other one is G Suite. So with Cloud Platform, many of you already know that's where you get the VMs, the big disks, the networking, the security, the machine learning, you know, all that stuff. Uh, on the G Suite side, of course, we know that, uh, you know, uh, it has Gmail, Google Drive, Calendar, Doc Sheets, and Slides. But what some people think is that, oh, the left side, GCP is for developers, and then the right side is only for users. Not quite true. Uh, because behind most of the G Suite applications that you know how to use, there's also a developer API, so you can code them as well. So that's what that's what I did. You know, the last six years when I was on the G Suite team, I was actually um, you know creating uh, in, uh, instructions and tutorials and blog posts and videos to show developers how they can code G Suite. But we're only going to focus on cloud platform today. Okay, so cloud platform. There's so many products. I obviously don't don't have time to talk about all of them. Um, I do want to focus on serverless stuff, and most of the serverless stuff lies in compute. So that would be the App Engine Cloud Functions and Cloud Run. But we also have like AI and ML, we have big data, identity security, uh, a lot of developer tools, API platforms, ecosystems, IoT stuff, um, data storage, databases, data transfer, a lot of that stuff, management tools, networking. So there's just like many things. It's probably around 200 or more by now. I can't even keep track of all of it, okay? And of course, don't forget G Suite because you can code them too. All right, uh, where does G Suite and GCP fit into our little cloud computing picture? So uh, the easiest way is anything that's SaaS flavored lives in G Suite and anything that is below that, which is platform and below is all GCP. So that's pretty easy to figure out. All right, so that's Google Cloud. Now let's talk about the different ways that you can run your code on Google Cloud Serverless. Okay, so uh, like most cloud platforms, we have VMs and we have big disk, all right? You can get a, a, a micro, a very small you know, uh, VM for free every month. 
uh, from Google, uh, from Cloud Platform, all the way up to the biggest, most expensive machine uh, VM that you can rent has 416 vCPUs, 12 terabytes of RAM, and 256 terabytes of disk. So it's it's really big, and, and of course it's really expensive. Um, you know that machine. I think it's about 82 US dollars every hour. So it is pretty expensive, but look what you get, right? Uh, and then we have cloud storage, which is where all of your data goes. It's called the data lake because all of your data rivers flow into the data lake, right? So all your blob storage is there. And of course, our VMs support most versions of Linux as well as most of the major versions of Windows Server. So yes, you can get those. But as I was mentioning earlier, if you're writing code and applications, why do you want to do this extra work of having to determine which one of these operating systems to use, what is your tech stack and all that stuff, right? So that's why we have serverless, okay? So serverless exists, well, okay, first it's a lie. Of course there are servers, uh, right? But when we say serverless, what we mean by that is that it's not your problem, all right? You don't have to worry about it. You can focus on your applications and solving problems for your customers, your users, and things like that. Uh, now, why is it important? Why should you know about it? Well, according to analyst research, uh, 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 you know, companies spend uh, the uh, amount of money has been doubling every other year. They've started keeping track in 2016, uh, and it's projecting to grow, to double again, almost double uh, over the next year, and then another two years beyond that. So, so it is a very hot field because a lot of companies are spending money on it. All right, so that's one important reason. Another thing is, you know, uh, going viral is a big thing. If you develop a startup and it gets really popular, well, guess what? If you didn't like buy enough machines or rent enough VMs. Uh, you won't be able to handle the new traffic, so your customers will be unhappy, and then they're not going to use your service, right? Uh, so fortunately, some of our cl uh, cloud computing uh, serverless products have auto-scaling. So if you go viral, we will continue to scale out as traffic comes in. So we can monitor, you know, if your traffic, if your app is getting a lot of traffic, we're going to spin up more instances and things like that. And then when traffic goes down, we shut those down so you don't have to pay for it. Then the opposite is true. What if you don't go viral? What if you as a, you know, you got some money to start a company and then you spent too much on hardware and no users are, are there? You have no users. Well, guess what? You spent too much money on hardware. You could have spent it on another engineer. And now you're also not going to be successful because you just were never known, right? Nobody knew who you were. So the other cool thing that serverless handles is this opposite uh, situation where you don't get traffic. Guess what? If your code is not running on serverless, you don't have any instances up, which means you're not getting billed, which means you're not paying. So that's yet another reason why. All right, so what are the three serverless products we have? The first one is App Engine. This is where you wanna host an entire app in the cloud. So App Engine exists because many years ago when our engineers built this, they asked a lot of companies, what was the hardest thing for you, for your company to be successful? They said, well, we spent too much time getting machines and the operating system, databases, web servers, security patches, and we were not really spending much time working on our app, okay? So based on that feedback, we decided to try and change this model so that the developer just focuses on the code and then we take care of all of this uh, we handle auto scaling. You just upload the code to Google and then we take care of everything else for you. So that's really the main idea behind App Engine. Um, by the way, uh, just because you have an app does not mean that uh, it, ha it's, it, it doesn't have to have a web user interface. There's a lot of users that we have that just have uh, mobile apps and uh, the mobile app has to talk to something and so it talks to their App Engine service. So yes, you can have an app on App Engine without a web interface, it's optional. But you know, better is if you wrote your app to support both a web interface as well as a mobile uh, mobile app. All right, it's it's better when you do both because you, your users can be anywhere, right? So that's really the main idea. It's not just for web uh, web uh, web apps. Okay, so a lot of popular use cases for App Engine. You know, like I said, mobile backends, a lot of social uh, social apps, mobile mobile gaming, uh, a lot of consumer web apps. Uh, uh, it's used a lot in schools because it's it's pretty it's mostly free, right? Students love free. And of course it's used for business apps as well. So here is your MVP or minimal viable product. This is the world's smallest app engine app you can write. It has only three files. It's in Python, uh, but we support, uh, you know, PHP and Go and Java and Java, you know, Node and Ruby. So it's not just Python, but Python requires the least amount of lines of code. So that's why I use that. So I have a configuration file that says I want to use Python 3.7. My main app is a web app. It uses the Flask web framework, and it's just the hello world that goes to Slash on my website. And then I have, you know, what are the all the um, 
Python packages that I need. So that goes in the requirements file. So you only really need these like three files and roughly about seven lines of code. Uh, if you download the SDK, you just type gcloud app deploy and in 60 seconds, so under a minute, almost always under a minute, uh, your app is available around the world, even in America, right? Uh, you get a free domain as well too, okay? And then there's a quick start. I'll have another link to the quick start, but that's the quick start. Um, so anyway, so that's the world's smallest app engine app. And you know, like I said, you get a free domain, your app is up in 60 seconds. It's, it, it takes care of everything for you, really it does. Okay, so here's the link uh, to the same link as the last page. So, um, uh, of course, we also have it available in Java, Node, PHP, Go, and Ruby too, because we support those other languages. But this is the Python one because we're at a Python conference. All right, moving on, let's talk about Cloud Functions. So why does Cloud Functions exist? Well, maybe you don't have an entire app. Maybe you don't want to worry about frameworks like a LAMP stack, a mean stack. Um, and you just, you just want to deploy like really small functions or microservices, okay? Um, and the other cool thing that uh, that uh, Cloud Functions does that App Engine cannot do is that it can run based on background events. Like, you know, with App Engine, I have to uh, hit a, you know, I have to have my mobile app calling my app or I have to go to a web browser. But with Cloud Functions, you could say, I want my Cloud Function to trigger if somebody sent a message through the Cloud Pub Sub message queue or maybe somebody uploaded a file to cloud storage, or maybe somebody logged into Firebase, okay? So anytime those background events happen, you can make a cloud function execute. So it's event-driven processing, so you can do that too. So each HTTP, we're calling it directly, or background events, it's great. Like App Engine, it's also uh, auto-scaling and highly available, and of course, you're only paying if users are calling it. Uh, the other cool thing that it can do that App Engine things that are bolded. So all the bolded things are things that Cloud Functions can do, but App Engine cannot. Uh, and one of them is uh, develop all of your code in the browser. So in, in uh, App Engine, you saw that I had a command line G Cloud app deploy. I had to run that on the command line. With Cloud Functions, you can also do it from the command line, but you can also do everything from the web browser. It makes it pretty easy. And there's also an, a second version of uh, Cloud Functions just for Firebase apps, which uh, Firebase is, our, is Google's mobile uh, development platform for iOS and for Android. And of course, there's a Firebase database for it too. Um, and Cloud Function supports uh, JavaScript, Python, Go, and Java. Um, by the way, doing Cloud Functions is much faster than all, all anything else. So, you know, with a VM, of course, it takes time to set up the VM. If you have more than one VM and you want to have a Kubernetes cluster, that also takes a lot of time to set up. App Engine is much faster than those two, but Cloud Functions is even faster than App Engine. You can actually, you know, like I said, do everything in the browser. You can do hello world in like five minutes. It doesn't even take 15 minutes. Functions is very fast. Again, it's because you don't have an entire app. So there's a lot less, uh, less functionality, uh, less comp complexity. Okay, so to create a function, you can do it from the web, uh, web uh, browser, step one. Uh, choose your project and then find cl the cloud function section in the console, then click create function. You know, choose the name of the function, the memory, the trigger type, the, you know, is it Node, is it Java, uh, uh, Python, you pick a language, then you write the code in the browser and then you click to deploy and then you test it afterwards, it's pretty easy. Uh, or you do everything locally on your computer and you deploy on the command line, okay, pretty basic. And then, like I said, uh, you can trigger a cloud function from many different sources, so HTTP or based on any kind of events. So that's just a, some, a list of what some of the events are that supported. Uh, so here's your Hello World uh, MVP for uh, Cloud Functions, a one-liner, very simple. If you do deploy on the command line, it's a little bit more complex than the App Engine one because guess what? There's no config files, right? So you have to do everything on the command line. Again, 60 seconds, and then it's up, available around the world, so you can hit it with your browser or use curl to do it from the command line. Uh, and then here's kind of like what it looks like in the web browser. So uh, general is where you uh, put in the information about what kind of cloud function you want, how much memory it takes, you know, how fast the CPU, what language. Trigger is how do you want that cloud function to execute. Uh, then you can edit your source code. And then when you deploy, you can click on the testing tab. You can type in the input uh, JSON payload and then click test the function. And then you'll see the output from the cloud function down at the bottom. Okay, so it's pretty basic. All right, so that is it. And there's a quick start uh, for you too. Now, last one is Cloud Run. This is container hosting in the cloud. So what is a container? Well, containers are, have become much more popular because with these serverless tools like App Engine and Cloud Functions, maybe you can't use one of those supported languages. Maybe you have a C library that does graphics, right? 
Uh, maybe you have a binary and you can't you can't do that with those two other serverless systems. So this is the reason why because you can use any language, any library, any binary. And of course, there's a lot of well-known base images that are already out there. It's very, very flexible. That's one of the reasons why people choose containers. Okay, uh, I am missing a slide. I lost my slide. The other slide that was missing was, what about serverless? So with serverless, it's it's called, it's about convenience. Any language, any library, any binary. And of course, there's a lot of well-known base images that are already out there. Very, very flexible. That's one of the reasons why people choose containers. Okay, I think somebody has to mute. Okay, uh, I am missing a slide. I lost my slide. The other slide that was missing was, what about... Uh, I'm not going to be able to, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Uh, okay. So, uh, so, and serv so serverless is convenient, not flexible. Uh, okay. So everything changes with cloud run. So with cloud run, uh, it gives you the ability to run a container servicely, serverlessly. So you can have any language, any library, any binary, just like a regular container can, uh, you bundle. So you put all your code in, uh, by the way, you have is you have to leave an HTTP port open to us so that Google can call your container. Uh, and it has to be stateless. All right, so just make it item potent. Uh, bundle in the container. You can use Docker or you can use build packs. Uh, that goes into the container registry and then you can deploy with Cloud Run. Okay, pretty basic. All right, okay, so here's a slide. So serverless is inaccessible for some people because they have restrictions. Uh, another restriction I didn't mention is they can be locked in, right? If you code everything in like deep APIs for a pass system, you won't be able to get off. So uh, you wanna really have the combination of serverless uh, and containers, all right? So that's what Cloud Run is. It is a fully managed serverless execution environment that runs stateless HTTP containers, okay? Anti-vendor lock-in, because guess what? Once you that we have, right? It's pretty obvious. So anyway, it's, a, it's basically containers as a service. You can think of it that way, okay? All right, what else? How about our Cloud Run MVP? So the sample app we have is gonna be similar to the App Engine one. All right, so you're gonna have uh, Flask, here's your Hello World. The only thing that's different is I have a, a line down at the bottom to actually run it, because when I had App Engine, I guess what, App Engine's web server ran my code. But since I have a container now, I actually have to start the web server application myself. So that's what the bottom two lines are for. And the files into my app directory. I run pip to install Flask, um, I think, yeah, uh, to install Flask and anything else that was in my requirements.txt file. You can have a Docker ignore as well. And then what you do is you build your container. So this is, uh, so the gcloud build command is kind of like Docker build plus Docker push combined together. So it makes a, uh, sorry. Uh, so it makes a container, uh, uh, it makes a container and then it installs and then if you want to actually run your container, then you just run gcloud run. And then uh, just like App Engine and Cloud Functions, you get a free domain name that you can use. Of course, you can always point your custom domain to it. All right, and there's your quick start. So to wrap up, uh, what, you know, I want to give you some examples of some inspirational apps. Ooh, wait, one more thing. So this is slightly off topic, but we have actually four serverless products. I just want to mention this one. It's, it's in JavaScript, so I don't have too much on it because but I do need to know you to know that we have four serverless products, not just three. The three that I just mentioned, they're all on cloud platform. This is one is actually on the G Suite side. So if you actually find yourself working with a lot of G Suite and uh, G Suite and you're comfortable with JavaScript, uh, here is a hello world in JavaScript for uh, App Script, which is a way for you to use Google APIs by op with objects and not by using REST or HTTP. Uh, so basically, you're just like uh, doing spreadsheet app dot get active sheet dot get cell a1 in the upper corner of a spreadsheet put hello world into it and then save it run it and then boom you can program it so this is not python so you can kind of skip that but uh one day hopefully we can make python work with app script as well too but right now it's only available in javascript so i just want to mention that so anyway so to wrap up the talk i want to show some inspirational apps uh, that one of my summer interns did uh, a couple of years ago so uh, he wrote a Hangouts chat productivity tracker or, or a Google chat productivity uh, uh, tracker. So what does that mean? So he's a student, but he also has a job because he has to pay for his school. And so what he did was he wrote it, uh, a chat bot so that every day he got home from school, he would tell the app, hey, um, uh, uh, he sends, sends a chat message that says start or log. Okay. And then uh, it goes to an app engine app. 
all right? And the App Engine app will go and create a table in, in Cloud SQL. So he's creating a relational database. And then so what he does is uh, he'll keep on, uh, so he'll keep on logging events. So now that it's started, it's gonna record all of his events. So whatever he does after school, like uh, I, um, I did homework for this class, I did homework for this class, I did some contracting work for this company, I ate dinner with my friends. And then at the end of the night, he can type end, and what that'll do is that'll ca ca cause the App Engine app to terminate and to grab the data out of Cloud SQL. It will call the Cloud Natural Language Machine Learning API to analyze all the work that he's done. And then it puts all the results into a spreadsheet. Uh, and then he can go and you know, uh, you know, send an invoice to wh whatever company he worked for. He knows how much time he spent on homework. So it basically helps him be more productive. So that's that interesting app. Uh, here's a kind of example of how it works in Google Chat. So he just types log, log this event, log this event, log this event. Uh, and I think he shows a spreadsheet. Okay, I know he goes really fast. He didn't spend, he didn't put too many frames on the animated GIF for the spreadsheet. But anyway, it actually works, which is pretty cool. So this is the app. Um, you can get it from this GitHub repo right here. And he also presented it as a talk at the Google Developer Group uh, user group in Silicon Valley uh, after before going back to school a couple of years ago. Uh, that was his first app. His second app is using Google Docs as an IDE. So what did he do here? So the main idea behind this app is... Uh, hey, listen, yes? I'm, I'm sorry for cutting you across. Uh, we are uh, one minute over the 40 minute mark. Oh, okay. All right, let me just uh, show the, uh, show the yes, end please. slides. Okay, great. Uh, so anyway, so he wrote this for 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 a professor who's managing students who wants to run code. They don't know how to. They're not developers professionally. So he's uh, writing an app that he, they can type their code in Google Docs. It reads everything out of the Google Doc, the code, and then it spawns a virtual machine, runs the uh, installs Python, runs the code, and then puts the output back into Google Docs. So you know you can type Python code in a Google Doc. He runs it, and then you'll see the output in the thing. That's it. Uh, this app hasn't been published yet. I'm going to try and get it published uh, within a couple of years. It'll take me a while because he left already and went back to school. Okay, so to wrap up here, some links for you. So why go cloud computing? Cloud computing is taking the world by storm. Why serverless? It lets you focus on just your code. It's great. Um, uh, there's a lot of other Google APIs besides cloud that you can consider using. And, that, and here are some links to help you, you know, Get started, uh, Python links as well too, comparisons to AWS and Azure in case you're curious. And that is it. So uh, link to the slides is right down here. Uh, and then also you can use the barcode to get to the slides as well. If you notice that there's a purple uh, progress bar at the bottom of the slides to show you how far along I am in the slide deck, that's a, a G Suite add-on that you write in JavaScript, but people can code that. And again, the uh, so that's my Twitter. Please drop me a line on Twitter. Uh, and then again, the link to the Google Doc. All right, so I'm sorry I went over. I don't know if we have time for questions, but that is it. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you so much, Wesley. Um, you know, usually in uh, a live audience, we would have had a round of applause, uh, but uh, you know, I just have to suffice for me, and I know everyone else is clapping as well. Uh, thank you so much. And uh, we have, unfortunately, we don't have time for question and answers. But you will be available on Zulip and on Twitter, right? Zulip so for some more time and Twitter, like forever. How long as as long as Twitter is available, I suppose. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll be around on Twitter. Uh, I will try and stay on the chat. I will actually try and answer the questions in chat after I'm gone here. I'll stay in the stream yard and answer the questions there. But otherwise, uh, hit me up on Twitter. Uh, I don't know how long I'm going to stay on chat, only because it is almost 1:30 in the morning, and I probably need to go to sleep. So, oh. but thank you. Yeah, so uh, we've noted down all the questions, guys, and uh, we will make, uh, we'll get them, uh, we'll try and get them out to Wesley so that we can get back the answers at least and we can put them on Twitter and, you know, we'll okay. make it so that uh, this lag is, is caught up. So, Great. again, thank you all so much. I think the chat session is going, you know, like bonkers because, you know, everyone's enjoyed the talk a lot. Wesley, thank <laughs> you so much. And uh, yeah, I think. Uh, We'll move on to the next thing. Thank you so much. Okay, great. Thank you.